Kids going to emergency rooms for mental health care because they have nowhere else to go. More law enforcement agencies are blocking the public from scanner traffic after Denver goes silent. Hey, speaking of hush hush, Marshall crashed a secret meeting between the governor and legislators who totally weren't mad that Marshall was there and totally didn't constantly talk about it. A small town's snow dispute has an unclaimed pile sitting in the middle of an intersection. And a mayor apologizes for a city's subpar snow removal. Want to guess which one? Next. Medical emergency? We push ahead to the ER if it's serious. How about a mental health crisis? Thousands of Coloradans have been going to the emergency room for those, too. That includes children. Arnusha Roy looks at the result. For six months, the patients coming into Denver Health's emergency room have been getting younger. The point where every day we do see children. Some of these kids come straight from school and their parents are called to the ER. If the teachers are not able to manage them behaviorally. Or their families bring them here when they don't know where else to go. They may have been at home and then said something like they feel suicidal or they're really depressed. We were surprised that it was as high as it was for um, children under 18. In that same six month time span, the Center for Improving value in healthcare was studying data and found between 2016 and 2018, 17,000 Coloradans went to the emergency room and received a mental health diagnosis. One out of every four of those visits were kids under the age of 18, often diagnosed with depression. Because this data only shows us who is coming, it doesn't really tell us the reasons why. We're the first available access. So I we're open 24 7. For people who have been told to wait when they can't, they know they can come here. While they don't always know who else is out there to help, like the Colorado Crisis Services, which is why the state launched a campaign called Below the Surface specifically for kids. Some of them will tell us they have an appointment a, a month out. They might be able to call and there's nothing available for another two weeks. If it's an emergency, this is the right place to be. But for the kids who might need long term care, a short visit with an ER doctor isn't the ideal place to start. When it comes to safety, sometimes it's the best available option. So the state also has a new law that's reinforcing penalties to make sure people are getting mental health care appointments within a week. I'm saying reinforcing, though, because this was already a law, but a lot of people weren't following it in Colorado. So this new state law is essentially saying Colorado is serious about this. Get yeah. people in as soon as you can. Talk about these these young people who are having trouble at school and end up in the ER. You would hope that these resources would be there like on the school campus for them. Yeah, and that's been an ongoing conversation and Denver Health has actually set up clinics in 18 different schools in Denver mm -hmm. specifically for this so that access to therapists and help can be as easy as possible. All right. Thank you, Nusha. Law enforcement agencies across the metro area are increasingly taking control of what you know and when. They're doing this by encrypting their radio transmissions so that citizens, including journalists, can't listen in to what's happening and share that information. The Arapahoe County Sheriff says they have to go encrypted just so they can talk to the other agencies that have already done it. Arapahoe says it is one of a half dozen agencies that will go silent to the public in January. Now, all of them cite officer safety, but now we're beginning to hear this idea that well, we just have to be part of the club. The Douglas County Sheriff's Office went quiet on Monday, along with Elbert County and police in Castle Rock, Lone Tree and Parker. The Douglas County Sheriff's Office wants media outlets to trade access to scanner traffic for an agreement that journalists will not record or broadcast the transmissions. Arapos considering something similar. Media outlets throughout Denver refused to sign a similar contract to get access to Denver police scanners. The media outlet cited liability concerns and an, an insistence by police who wanted to come into newsrooms to inspect journalists' records. So let me let you in on a little secret of our business. When an elected official says, this isn't a story, or if they're like, well, if you're here, it must be a slow news day, well then, bingo, bango, we know we have something interesting. It's what politics guy Marshall Zellinger heard when he crashed a hush-hush meeting between Governor Polis's administration and Democratic legislators. I'll admit this meeting with the governor, members of his cabinet, and Democratic state lawmakers is not that earth-shattering. But from the start, I could tell... Well, hello. Hi. Nothing better to do today, huh? My presence made it more... Exciting? Marshall, Marshall. You see, I found out yesterday that the governor was meeting with Democratic lawmakers and his department heads. And today, when I called some Democratic lawmakers to find out when and where, I got 
and other hesitant responses. First of all, I want to make sure everybody knows our, our good friend Marshall Zondra is here. So, uh, but when I figured out when and where, I was given a king's welcome. It's obvious that it's slow news day. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. Well, today's slow news day involves conversations about where do you want the state to be in 10 years? If we reach every goal, we didn't set them high enough. Um, so uh, I'm sure Marshall will have a lot of fun after another you know, year tracking the ones on the <laughs> Clearly another fan of Polis's promises. Okay, Governor Jared Polis has held listening events similar to this one in Greeley, Pueblo, and Grand Junction. Those had what this one does not. Republicans. With Republican legislators, I have a regular leadership meeting with Republican legislators. If they invite me to their retreats, obviously I'm happy to come and speak. The, uh, uh, the Democrats have, the Republicans haven't yet. Would you do this with Republican lawmakers where you invite them? Yeah, we'd be thrilled to. Um, we'd be thrilled to. Or we'll be happy to extend that invitation. So what about the whole surrounding this meeting? Polis thought lawmakers may just not have known what to expect. Anything that legislators are going to say to our cabinet or one another, they know because they're sharing it with a, a large group isn't going to be secret anyway. Bingo, bingo. The governor's office sends out a public event schedule for the governor, lieutenant governor, and cabinet members each week. Kyle, guess what? This event yeah. was not on that calendar. Well, again, there, bingo, bingo, tells you that, that it is a story. Is that, do only old people say that? I thought the kids I just said heard, that. I just heard it today. Oh, jeez. From right. you. This is, bad. this is bad news for me. All right, thank you, Marshall. Presidential candidates have been making pilgrimages to Aurora to talk about gun control, and they are almost always welcomed there by Democratic State Representative Tom Sullivan, who lost his son Alex in the Aurora Theater shooting. Sullivan told us that he recently got a call from former New York City Mayor Mike Bloomberg, and Sullivan suggested that Bloomberg also come to Aurora to announce his national gun policy agenda. When they reached out uh, to me, um, you know, my, my suggestion is come to Aurora. Um, that's where the people are, that's where the event um, happened. It doesn't make me uncomfortable to be, I mean, as you know, I mean, I've been to that theater. I go to that theater on a regular basis. It might make somebody else uncomfortable knowing that I'm in front of that theater and them going back to their, that day, and I'm okay with that. Be, be prepared to be uncomfortable around me uh, talking about this issue, you know, outside of the movie theater. Sullivan will be alongside Bloomberg when he speaks at Heritage Christian Center on exposition near the Century 16 movie theater in Aurora. Two congressmen from Colorado both questioned witnesses at today's impeachment hearing in Washington. First, Republican Congressman Ken Buck of Windsor, a staunch defender of President Trump. Buck argued that tons of presidents abused their power for political gain, even Honest Abe. They've said that if a president abuses his power for personal or political gain, it's impeachable conduct. So how about when Abraham Lincoln arrested uh, legislators in Maryland so that they wouldn't convene to secede from the Union. And, and Virginia already had seceded, so it would have placed Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, in the middle of uh, the, the rebellion. Would that have been an abuse of power for political benefit? Well, it could be under that definition. After that, Democratic Congressman Joe Neguse of Lafayette got his turn. He did not delve into whether Abraham Lincoln abused his power for political gain. Neguse challenged the Republicans' legal scholar on the issue of obstruction. Am I correct that no president in the history of the Republic before President Trump has ever issued a general order instructing executive branch officials not to testify in an impeachment inquiry? That's where I'm not sure I can answer that affirmatively. President Nixon did in fact allow his chief of staff and his chief counsel to testify, and this president has not. We know that President Clinton responded to interrogatories propounded by that impeachment inquiry agree with that. and that this president has not. Colorado's congressional delegation is split along predictable partisan lines on the impeachment inquiry. The Democrats are all in favor. The Republicans are all opposed. In tonight's edition of Presented Without Comment, a mayor apologizes for a city's shoddy snow removal effort. Mayor Emily Larson of Duluth, Minnesota. I am here to acknowledge that we have not fulfilled our commitment on the snowstorm this time for neighborhoods and residents. And I was raised that you step into uh, shortcomings and you own them uh, and you let people know that you will strive to do better. Yeah. Yeah. 
It's a sign of sarcasm in a small town, a snow job that landed a guy in court. And we meet Coloradans concerned with space junk. As material starts crashing into each other in space, it becomes smaller and smaller, and material traveling at 22,000 miles an hour can still cause a lot of damage. Apparently, this is a real problem. They're trying to come up with solutions. Next. It's a sign of a big time snow dispute in a small town. A next viewer named Terry spotted this mound of snow in Salida. It's right in the intersection at 3rd and F Street, straight in the middle of town. The handwritten sign on top there says code compliant. Salida police tell us a guy was plowing snow for an auto body shop. He got in trouble because he just stuck the snow on a sidewalk. When police asked him to move it, he moved it to the middle of the intersection. Police went out a second time, gave him a ticket. So he's going to court later this month. After a quiet week, another storm on the way, but this one's coming from the south. It's not terribly cold. Temperatures in the upper 40s at DIA, mid 50s downtown. That did allow for a little bit of melting of snow and ice. And this system is taking its time getting to Colorado, but it's coming. And we expect snow in the mountains after midnight and a rain snow mix in Denver for the morning drive. Less than a half an inch of accumulation for many areas. And again, some of the precip will come in as rain initially, which is weird to be forecasting in December. The only advisories for traveler in the 
southern mountains and we may have light snow showers off and on during the day tomorrow, but the storms out tomorrow night. No issues this evening, increasing clouds and 28 tomorrow. We have a mostly cloudy day with rain and snow showers off and on during the day, probably the heaviest before lunchtime. 41 tomorrow, 48 on Friday. The parade of lights, mild forecast for that next chance for rain and snow coming in Sunday night into Monday and then a nice warming trend back to the mid 50s by the middle of next week. Our next question comes from a viewer named AJ who really wants to know what happened to Ralphie 5 since she retired last month. AJ is asking because he's a buff, class of 1976. AJ, here's the deal. This is going to be an unsatisfying answer. CU will only say that Ralphie has retired to her ranch in the metro area. They won't give any other details about her location because they don't want anybody messing with her. You may recall uh, one of the original Ralphies uh, was, was kidnapped in the 1970s, was, was, was bison napped. Uh, Ralphie 5 made her final appearance at Folsom Field at the last home game November 23rd. Did not run on that occasion. This is previous file tape, but they celebrated her career and clapped on and so on and so forth. There are more than a half million pieces of trash floating around Earth in space. Students at the School of Mines think they have a solution. They'll launch it soon. Five hundred thousand 
pieces of trash are, are floating along peacefully orbiting Earth. Well, I mean peacefully until they, they smash into a satellite or a spacecraft or something. That's no bueno. The smart students at the School of Mines think they have a solution to space junk. They showed it to our Byron Reed. This is called so Fundamentals of Astrodynamics. When it comes to taking the perfect picture to mark a milestone. Um, we are launching in August of 2020. Planning ahead can make all the difference in the world. But we're mainly focusing on getting our boom to work. Um, we're prototyping a boom, so we're going to have um, about a five foot boom deploy and it's going to take a picture. Bree Treffner is an engineering physics major at the Colorado School of Mines, leading a group of students who are spending their senior year thinking about trash in space. As material starts crashing into each other in space, it becomes smaller and smaller, and material traveling at 22,000 miles an hour can still cause a lot of damage. And it wraps up pretty tightly, it sounds yes. like. Treffner is project leader of the school's Rocksat X team, a NASA guided program created to give students low cost access. Furthest Minds has ever gone with a space project. To launch meaningful scientific experiments like their space debris cleanup. As those minuscule pieces are hitting those larger satellites, they're breaking off into more pieces, and that's like the, the Kessler syndrome, which is the idea you get this cascading effect of collision. The team is designing and building three experimental methods for removing the smallest pieces of space junk, like metal and paint fragments less than one centimeter in size. Up here, this is our sure laser subsystem. Here uh, right here, you can see our magnet <laughs> subsystem. And then on the other side, hidden behind this, is yeah. going to be our static no, subsystem, no, looking for ways to kill the momentum of the particles so that they'll fall into Earth's atmosphere and essentially just burn up. The students hope to get evidence that their cleanup is working. It will have an antenna satellite that's going to be sending those pictures down to our ground station, which will be at the launch site. And give them a snapshot of what's ahead for the next generation of aerospace pioneers. It's awesome how many people are interested in space and, and want to participate in these projects and are concerned about these things. For Next, I'm Byron Reed. Team says next summer they'll be blasting those experiments up 90 miles into suborbital space on a rocket provided by the Colorado Space Grant Consortium. Your feedback tonight includes a very good question about that mayor we saw apologizing for shoddy snow removal. That's next.
family won't let you live down a holiday fail. You got to remind them it's the thought that counts. Our next viewer, Jean in Englewood, shared a story about Christmas to her place one year when her grandmother unknowingly added an extra layer to the chocolate pinwheel cake. It was a pot holder left in there. They didn't realize it until they tried to cut the cake. You can imagine that didn't go well. Jean says grandma tried to sneak it back into the kitchen to remove the pot holder, but the family caught on and well, never let it let, never let her live it down. Keep the holiday fails coming. There are enough to last us through Christmas. Email us at next at 9news.com or show them to us with the hashtag pay next. Finish with your feedback tonight. Apparently Scott says uh, my my old man phrase, my bingo bango thing is actually the most famous Colorado fishing phrase ever. First fish, biggest fish, most fish, bingo, bango, bongo. Again, I don't know what I'm doing out here. Jim Medlock asks a really good question about that mayor that we saw apologizing for her city's shoddy snow cleanup. Jim says, is the mayor of Duluth, who apologized for poor snow removal, up for re-election in 2020? I look, Jim, and the mayor, Emily Larson, was actually just re-elected last month with two-thirds of the vote. I think it was just a real apology.